Uh, we want to welcome everybody to Interview Tips. I am Jess Weber. I'm the Chief Talent Demel Development Officer of Creatively, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Karis Jones, the VP of Human Resources for Skims and Good American. And in the spirit of our topic, I'm going to be interviewing Karis about interview tips. So we're going meta today. But before uh, diving into that, I thought we both introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit more about who we are. As I mentioned, I'm the Chief Talent and Development Officer at Creatively, which means I help Creatively as well as brands like Skim Skin American connect with qualified talent. Prior to joining Creatively, I spent about eight years at Russell Reynolds, which is a global executive search firm. For those of you who aren't familiar with executive search or Russell Reynolds, I could be hired by brands to uh, find great talent, primarily in the C-suite or at the VP and above level. But while I was there, I also founded and led the creative practice. So I myself have interviewed thousands of people and I have my own expertise in creative hiring. I will now pass the Zoom to you, Karis, if you want to uh, tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. So my name is Karis Jones. Uh, as Jess mentioned, I worked as the VP of Human Resources for Good American and SKIMS. Um, we, I've been with them for about three years, a little bit less with SKIMS since they are brand new and have been in business about two years. Um, I handle everything in the human resources world. So that's going to be recruiting, um, employee relations, benefits, um, so many things, but definitely hiring and interviewing, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you know, the the job market is a little bit winky, a little bit crazy. And, and uh, right now, and we're all hearing things about great resignation and all kinds of new terms we, we are kind of unfamiliar with. So I think this is just a great topic to be speaking about and sharing information um, as there's, I'm sure, uh, many people in the job market right now really looking for, for roles that resonate with them. So happy to be here. Great. So as I mentioned, I, I put together my own list of questions that I thought would resonate with all of you. But as Lizzie put in the chat, if you have a question while you're listening to my grilling of Karis about this topic, feel free to just put them in the Q&A and we'll either get to them in real time if they're salient to what we're talking about or at the end. So Karis, I thought we were interview tips. You know, there's the in the moment interview, but from my perspective, the interview actually begins before you even meet the person. There's what I call like the pre-interview stage. Uh, you make mm -hmm. your first impression on a company with your email, your application, your portfolio, whatever that first point of contact is. So I'd love to get your perspective on how candidates can make a great first impression through that process. Yeah, so, you know, I think there, there definitely is this pre-interview part, right? We usually post the job on Creatively or, um, you know, LinkedIn is obviously highly, highly um, accessible. And then we get, applications. And for a company like us, like a Skins or Good American or any kind of company that maybe is really hot, you're getting thousands of applications. And so I think it's really important to reach out directly. Um, cold, whether you know someone, you don't know anyone. Um, and, and so first, when you see the the ad, you want to look to see who sent it, you know, and that's the person you first send to, right? So you want to send out an email, who, this is who I am, um, this is what I can do, this is what I do. Um, I really love when people send something personal about the company. So you might send, you know, if you're a graphic designer, hey, I saw your last post on Instagram, or I saw your last email, I would have done something like this, or I think this would be really interesting um, in the next post. And, you know, of course, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, you don't know our plan. So we don't expect it to be directly related, but just to show that you're really interested in the brand, you're already um, aware of the brand and what they do. And that type of stuff really stands out to me um, when people are reaching out cold to say, oh, wow, this person took a few minutes to make something that displays what they do. It gives me a lot more insight as to 
um, what they could do for the business. And also going above and beyond, right? Showing Absolutely. their commitment, showing, you know, being really diligent, tracking down who did the job. It's, you know, it's also shows a lot of other aspects to, to who they are and how much they want the job. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why it sticks out. I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to look at that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> all right. Well, let me, let me put this person forward and, and see. Uh, what about social media? I know, especially in our creative community, many display their professional work on their own, you know, Instas and other social media. I have two questions. One, do you look before you decide to interview someone, do you look at their social media? And two, how can that play in play good or bad into that, into your decision-making? Absolutely. Um, I, we do look, we do look, uh, sometimes different periods throughout the interview process, uh, also depending on the role, but really with creatives, we absolutely look because, um, you know, your social media is kind of another form of a portfolio in essence. So, um, you know, we look, we say, even if it's, you're posting things on your personal page that are personal, right? It still lets me see, oh, how creative this person is. Um, oh, that's really interesting or, or the vibe that they have. Um, so I, I really, really recommend putting together your social media in a way that reflects um, your creative side. Um, and it can be bad. I mean, it, we have to be conscious of the reality that we live in. And social media is going to be one of those first stops that um, companies look at. And if it's a lot of weird stuff that may not be in line with the with the values of that company, that would be bad. So... <laughs> Right, especially I think oftentimes there sometimes people have a, a professional uh, you know Instagram or a different social channel or something on you know Vimeo if it's a video in nature and that or they mix it up with their personal. So I think just I think message here is if you're applying to a job on your public social media, maybe go through it beforehand um, with Absolutely. through a different lens. Right? Absolutely, <laughs> um, you know if if you're creative and you know, people are going to be looking, maybe the, the handle that you use with your name is a lot more professional and reflective of your, your work um, creatively. And then you can, I mean, if it's social media, you can make up any handle to, to do, you know, more fun um, stuff, or if you're passionate about um, an issue and you want to be vocal about that on social media, I wouldn't discourage it at all. Just maybe if you're looking for a job, don't put that under your first and last name. Got it. Um, and shifting gears to the candidate, yeah. like the their interview has been scheduled and they should be preparing. I know when I'm preparing for an interview, like I, I am doing homework diligence. I'm Googling that person. I'm looking up, you know, if they've spoken on YouTube, trying to find out everything I can. I'm curious, uh, just in general, and then specifically for a creative, if there's anything you recommend they do to prepare for that first interview. Yeah, absolutely want to do at, at least at minimum some basic research about the company. You want to know what they do, what type of service or product do they provide. You want to look up and see if there's any news, any press about them. Um, like Jess said, love looking on YouTube, see if any of their founders or, or executives have made any speeches or articles. You can get a lot of little um, droplets of information like that that you can use in the interview to when you answer questions. If you have information about our business, I'm already like, oh, wow, this is awesome. They're already looking into it, trying to figure out ways that they can impact the business. And that is a huge star next to your name. Um, The worst thing that can happen on an interview is, are you familiar with the brand? No, not really. Can you tell me about... No, not really. Okay. You know, that, that, that should not be your answer. It should be, yeah, I read this or I purchased this. I have, um, talked to many friends who, you know, who have told me they, they love the brand. Um, you know, I hear you guys are going through blank. Um, this is how I would handle that. Or these are some of the strategies that I thought about. Um, that those are the type of responses you want to want to have. You never want to go into an interview without having done at least some basic internet searches to find out what that company is about. Um, 
So yes, research is, is very important. Highly recommend that um, every time. Every time. And all this, I remember once I was interviewing someone and it was not a role related to, you know, any types of financial performance, but someone had like, because it was a public company, had read all the financial reports, yeah. and referencing the 10K. And I was like, wow, like you did your homework. So look, you don't have to read financial reports if we're an interview, but one, it's helpful. And again, it's an easy way to impress someone um, even if it's not salient to that to that role. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. So shifting gears. So okay, we're going through this journey of like pre-interview to interview. So just broadly speaking, we're, we've been talking a little about, you know, creative roles or non-creative roles in terms of format of an interview. How do you approach interviewing a creative candidate in terms of format, general interview questions, looking at their portfolio that would just be helpful to, for people to be aware of? Yeah, sure. So I think specific to creatives, um, I like to do multiple interviews. And I think you find that in, in most companies now. You're not, it's not just the one interview generally. Um, it's two, maybe even three interviews. I like three. I really like three. The first round of interview is usually very casual. I just want to find out if you're checking the basic qualification requirements. Um, we're going to have some you know, really um, entry conversation. Um, I, I want to hear about your experience, your background, um, you know, the, the ways that you've impacted your previous employers. You might hear some questions like, um, what makes, what are you, why are you interested in this role? Um, uh, why do you want to work for this company? You know, some of the basic ones you can Google and, and, basic questions. That's usually how the first round goes. Um, it's more of a screening. Just want to make sure that we want to move you forward. Um, the second interview um, with creatives is usually some type of test. So um, I generally don't do live tests, but some companies do do live tests, but we'll usually give a project or some type of test where we can actually see your work, the quality of work, um, that you can do in the moment or within a couple of days. Also lets us know the speed that you were working at, if you're able to complete the project. Um, so it's kind of a silent interview in a way, right? You're, we give you a project, we get it back, and then we analyze it amongst ourselves to see if we want to then move you to the third interview. And in that third round interview, um, we're getting deeper, right? So then we're asking the tougher questions. We're asking more questions around values, making sure that we align there. Um, and, and also in the third interview, sometimes I like to throw a, a curve ball and, and maybe have the interview, uh, the interviewer be, be someone that is not a direct, you wouldn't directly report into. Maybe it's someone who just works at the company that you would be working with cross-functionally to assess, hey, is this a, someone that we could work with cooperatively? So I like three interviews. I think you'll probably see something like that at least two most of the time in, the, in jobs that you apply for. And so that's how, especially for creatives, there's usually a test involved or some type of project that you'll need to complete so that we can see the, the level of work that you can do. And I, just, I always think that meeting more people is better, right? It's you as the candidate, you get to know the organization, you get a better perspective on the people, you're, not only the people you're gonna be working with, but kind of the vibe and the culture. Absolutely, you know, interviews are two-way street. I think uh, sometimes people forget about that, but it's absolutely, um, you know, I'm, I feel, or at least I hope I'm being interviewed as well, right? This, this right. is just us picking somebody. It, it's also about them picking us too. And, um, so you, you definitely want to have the candidate meet with a couple of different people so that we can get, uh, you know, a, a um, a very opinion there. Yeah, and to that end, I always I tell people as well, like if you don't feel like you've gotten the answers that you want, you should feel empowered to say, hey, Karis or whoever your point of contact is, I'd love to meet a few more people in, you know, the art department or fill in the blank people you're going to be working with. And it's also a good litmus test because if they say, of course, 
versus no, you have to give us an answer on the offer tomorrow or something that, you know, yeah. it's a it's a good kind of litmus test or just to, to see what type of company it is. Absolutely. Because they, Absolutely. Should, they should welcome that. Yeah, that actually that would impress me if somebody right. said, you know, I, I, I'm so happy I met with you and blank. Is there anyone else that I can meet with on the team? Or is it possible to do a panel with a few members of the team so that we can, um, you know, chat a little bit and exchange some ideas? I love that and would never say no to that. If I, if right, I, and there's a, but. sorry, I mean, it's also a common theme here from what yours is about taking that initiative, like from that first email to the interview and the fact that this is a two-way street and get an interview is not happening. It's if there's buying and selling, right? Like you're selling yourself, but the company is also selling themselves and it, it works both ways. Absolutely. It, it works both ways. Oh, sorry. Quick question that um, was actually relevant for this particular topic. Um, we had an anonymous attendee ask, would these interview questions also apply to interns and their approach? Yeah, so, you know, I in my experience, we we don't generally, well, sometimes we do have three interviews for interns. I would say, I would say usually it's, a, it's maybe two interviews for interns, but yeah, it, uh, intern is, there's not much difference to be, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we want to make sure that even with the, in, with the interns that we're bringing people in who could possibly work here on a possible, on a, on a full-time basis eventually. Um, that's, that's the whole point of, of internship programs is that we want to get people in that we think have the right, um, attitude and the right, um, uh, are, are building the right experience to then come on as a, you know, a permanent, um, employee. So yeah, definitely. If you're an intern, you still want to do the re outreach. You still want to do the research. You still want to have really good questions in the interview. You still want to meet as many people as possible. Um, I would, you know, all it is, is, is practice for the real thing. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, and one more question before we continue on, um, we had the question, what is your, um, what are your favorite types of questions that candidates can ask in the interview process? Oh, that's a tough one. What are my favorite type of questions? Um, you know, I really like questions that are that sound like, you know, what are what what are the company's goals over the next year? What um, you know, um, things around what what the business is going to be doing, I think, are really good. Um, it shows me that, hey, you're interested in what we're going to be building up to next, where the company is going, what's the future look like, where do I fit in there, what is this role impact? I think a, a question like that is good. Um, what, what are the expectations for this role in the first 90 days? Um, where are the gaps? in, in uh, that you're that you're experiencing right now. You want to find out as much information as you can to understand where you are able to make an impact in that business. So I think those are the type of questions that you want to be asking. Uh, the questions um, related to the company values, company attitudes. Um, it's really important to make sure that you are aligned there because the worst thing is when, you get into a company and you realize, hey, this is not what I thought it was. These are not my people. Let me run. <laughs> so these are questions that you want to ask early on. To you know, if if you're passionate about sustainability, you want to work for a company that um, you know is B Corp certified, like Good American, or has um, you know really great sustainability practices. You need to ask those questions up front. Um, if you want to work for, you know, you're looking at beauty companies, you want to make sure you're working for a company that doesn't test on animals, if that's important to you, you want to ask those type of questions. Um, so, so yeah, I think definitely questions about the business, where they're going, their plans, gaps, and expectations. And then again, you want to make sure that you're asking questions to find out that if your values align with the company values and attitudes. So just it. Oh, sorry, oh. Jess, go ahead. I was just going to say to put, you know, really um, 
you know, hit the nail on the head. I think Kara said was that you should always come to an interview prepared with questions. Like mm -hmm. that's, but one of the, I think oftentimes, especially if there's multiple rounds, you, you're, you don't necessarily have those, those, some of those questions are answered. So I have like one or two questions that you can ask anyone. One of my favorites is always, why did you join the company? Yeah. One, pe people love talking about themselves, but th and they will always have an answer. And it also could give you a different perspective on, you know, their journey and something you might not have, might, might not have asked previously. Another question kind of related to business goals is kind of like, what keeps you up at night? Yeah. Like, what are the things that are most salient in the short term that, uh, for that particular person? And I'm, you could, there's always like questions along those lines that you know someone's going to have an answer to and will help you learn as well. Sorry, Lizzie, go ahead. No, I love that. No worries. Um, related, um, Josefa asked, um, what are your least favorite questions that candidates ask? Um, you know, I don't know. That's tough to least favorite, but, you know, I always get, you know, what's the culture like? Very relevant question, but it, it's, and it's often you know, asked every single time. And I think that most companies have fairly stock answers to that, right? You know, whoa, it's very, everyone's great. It's very laid back. Yeah, we have a great time, you know? So, you know, I think it, it's great to, to just, to, well, like Jess said, everyone's favorite topic is the so so. <laughs> if you can get people uh, talking about their experience at the company, I think that is a little bit more valuable and it'll give you um, a little bit more insight into the culture and um, of the company overall. Right. And my response is asking questions you should probably know the answer to. Like I, I, we assume you've done your homework. So asking, like if some if it says on the job description who this role reports into when you walk in, Karis, who does the role report to? Like it, questions that exhibit that you have not done work, the right. you didn't, yeah you didn't do your work or you oh, should probably gonna do that right yeah. exactly right. yeah like hey you tell, tell me about this job right yeah. yeah so but i don't think there's any bad necessarily i can't think of any yeah. bad questions. i mean like you were right there's no stupid questions you know if, if someone asks i'm, I'm going to answer many there's very common questions and i think um you know another part of pre-interview or, or research it is thinking about the questions you're going to ask, you know, mm -hmm. not all the time, they're necessarily specific to any company that if you're interviewing with multiple companies, you may have, you know, five or six questions that you want to know every single time. Um, so you can think of um, some interesting ways to, to ask those questions. Um, or, you know, just just be prepared with um, some some questions that that make the the interview move along and, and, and interesting and Thank interactive for, for those responses um we can move forward and we'll have we have actually a ton of amazing ones rolling in so um, oh, okay. we'll save them towards the end and freckle them throughout but thank you so guys, I know we've covered a lot of ground already, but I'm sure if there are any other kind of do's or don'ts in terms of the actual interview itself that you think would be helpful to share, kind of just general interview tips. Um, so a really good interview for me is more of a conversation. Um, if you can get in, and sometimes it's just vibes and it doesn't always happen, but if you can get into a cadence with your interviewer where it's less question, answer, question, answer, but more of a flowing conversation where you're, you're both kind of listening, responding, understanding. Those are the best type of interviews. Um, I say don't one word answers, um, you know, very standoffish. I don't know. I don't care what I ask. Don't say I don't know. It's <laughs> you do you you can like I tell uh, my son sometimes. You know, let me look into that is even better than I don't know. Um, what you know, I, I can do some research and get back to you this afternoon through email. That works great. Um, but yeah, I would just try, I, I would just try and be, um, to, to give as much information as you can, be detailed if you can, specific if you can. Um, if you're working in uh, an area role or something that can be metric, um, definitely highlight, hey, I was involved in a project that went from, you know, this 
million to that million or increase by sales by this percentage or um you know reduce costs by this um you know you want to have um specific examples if you can that um are able to get your your point across i think we find um that most questions are, are going to be more behavior related right it's not just um one word answers it's can you give tell me about a time can you give me an example um so you want to make sure you have uh those those experiences ready uh what one thought that i just talked about is the failure like the failure question and uh, tell me uh, about a time you failed or no, tell yeah. me about a weakness yeah and oftentimes people try to do the the weakness that's not really a weakness yeah. like <laughs> i don't speak two languages and i'm like well i wouldn't i mean it'd be great if you did right I always, like we've all made mistakes we've all failed and it's much more authentic and real and i think it has more impact if you share a time you, you really made a mistake and what you and then what you learned from it um that's one of my inner pet peeves when i get the like non-failure failure yeah no one's perfect and you're trying to be perfect in an interview which to me is is not necessarily the best way to prove that no i i totally agree with that i i often you know will google stuff to see uh, or <laughs> or um tick tock human resources is my favorite now and the stuff, <laughs> some of the advice that people give is quite interesting um but but yes you you want to give more authentic answers mm -hmm. something that makes you come across as a human being and, and mm -hmm. not a robot for sure um yeah like jess said we all fail so you want to hear how you uh, were able to recover that's that's the story mm -hmm. that i want to hear Yes. And today, I think something we, we haven't touched on is like interviewing can be really nerve wracking for people, no matter where you are in your career, especially if it's a job you really want. Curious to get your thoughts on how to get into the zone and the mindset, especially sometimes we're in a world of COVID, we're on Zoom to just maximize those if it's 30 minutes and really make a strong first impression. Yeah, the nerves, the nerves can really get to you. I mean, even as an interviewer, I get nervous sometimes, right? So I'm like, oh, am I going to ask the right question? So, You're nervous right now. I know, I'm, right? All right, these <laughs> exactly. And so it's it's hard to to work through that sometimes. And I've even had instances where people, you know, kind of freeze up and you know need a need a second to compose themselves. And it's tough to to deal with that, you know. Um, it, it's different, I think, for everybody on on how to deal with those nerves. Um, I would really get in touch with how with how what makes me feel calm. You know, for some people, that's a quick meditation before the interview. Some people, you know, I think of like sports where, um, you know, you see athletes maybe listening to their headphones or listening to music or listening to something that helps them get to where they need to be. Um, you know, I think the best though, the best way to deal with nerves is to be prepared. If I'm mm -hmm. prepared for the interview, then I really don't have that much to be nervous about. I mean, there's always, you know, you don't necessarily know the person you're meeting. So it's always like, okay, well, how is this person going to interpret what I'm saying or, or how am I going to come across, which is, you know, always important, but I think the best way to deal with nerves at the end of the day is to just try and be as prepared as possible for the interview. Got it. So shifting to kind of the, 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 I guess not the last phase, but the interview ends and then there's your, your waiting and you ideally want to follow up. I know some people have mixed feelings on thank you notes, curious to get your perspective on one sending thank you notes, if you should or should not. And then if you do, what, what makes a thank you note stand out? So I think you should, um, I think I notice more when you don't. So I think it's important to send a thank you note. What I like to see in a thank you note is um, something that lets me know that you learned something or, or um, understood more than you did going in and then are then able to connect your experience to what you learned. So, you know, during our conversation, I heard you speak about blank, blank, blank. I think that I can make an impact there by 
blah, 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 or because I have done blank, blank, blank in my previous experience. Um, so what I would do in a thank you note is use that as an opportunity to come full circle and connect the dots from your conversation. Um, that that's the best use of that. Um, and then again, I, I would always say, if you're sending a thank you note, make it some open-ended question there so that you can continue the conversation. So the 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 thank you note should end, you know, and you can always say, when can I expect to hear from you? Um, what's the next step in the process? Those are classics that are that are that are good because then it, it requires some type of response. Um, but yeah, you just want to do whatever you can to stay in contact, keep that conversation going, keep the ball rolling to the next step in the process. Yes. And also great if you're talking about questions, sometimes you have a 30 minute interview, you don't have a time to yeah. ask a question, a great opportunity. They didn't have time to discuss this during the interview, to your point about open, open-ended questions. Yeah, I agree. I always say send a thank you note, but it's your point, it should be personal. Yeah. I, cover imagine the interviewer didn't know who like my name wasn't on it they should know that just sent it right it should be remind that same thing with the resume right like someone should know that it's yours it has your voice your tone it's reminiscent of the conversation and is authentic and personal the, the many of the themes that we've been talking about yeah absolutely i agree um one don't on thank you notes to the point about being personal uh situations where because at Russell Reynolds we often had like a team multiple people interviewing at companies and they would often forward them to each other say hey I got a, a thank you note from so and so and it was the exact same thank you note cut and paste to each person and they realized it by forwarding so they don't have to be dramatically different but even you know taking that time to if you've had 10 interviews it's hard to make you know each one different but do something to personalize it so that if for some reason they're shared, which they can be, because people are excited when they get thank you notes, um, to, to make sure you, you don't cut and paste and make anything boilerplate. Great point. Um, Chris, you talked a little bit about in the, you referenced asking about, um, like wh when should I expect to hear from you? I know every company is different in terms of their speed of hiring and how that works. Do you have any, I guess, rules of thumb around if you haven't heard back from companies, which often happens, when is the appropriate time after sending a thank you note for you to send that, hey, I'm just checking in, I'm still super enthusiastic note, um, or however you uh, want to phrase it so that you yeah. don't feel like you're, you're stalking somebody? Yeah, yeah. So uh, after the initial thank you note, I, I would say three to five days. Um, you want to reach back out and make contact, um, you know, uh, here at, at Skims and Good American, even between the two brands, we have different processes. Um, and so it could take a little longer at some places than, than others. Um, and I would say, even if you don't hear anything that next week, give it another three to five days and reach out again until you get back a yes or no, I would continue to reach out. Sometimes they're just doing more interviews and that can take time. Sometimes the approval process is a little bit longer than um, expected. Sometimes people are on vacation and <laughs> they just, you know, are going to get back in a couple of weeks. So um, I would, I'd say three to five days is a good, a good time period. Don't, inundate their inbox with a message every single day haven't heard from you haven't heard from you you know they they got it the first time but um you know i think once a week or something like that it, it's a good cadence until you get back um some information on next steps on it um shifting gears a little bit um Karen, we were talking um recently about kind of just background checks, which, you know, some, for some companies that can, and applications that can happen before you even have the interview, or maybe it's after their interview. I know you were doing some really interesting things at Skims and Good American to kind of ch change that process. I think it'd be really helpful for our community to hear more about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, of course, run background checks on, on everyone. We usually do that toward the, the third interview. Um, 
But yeah, we we had a discussion um, on our executive team earlier this year um, about drug convictions and marijuana um, convictions, which you know um, can can um, sometimes be more prominent in Black and Brown communities or underserved communities, and um, with the legalization in, in California and many other states, you know, we've decided that we're not going to let those types of convictions be uh, a barrier to um, uh, having a good candidate come in. You know, um, again, like we talked about earlier, none of us were perfect. We've all made mistakes or wrong place, wrong um, wrong time, or been put in situations, especially as teenagers or, or young people, college students that we didn't um, expect to find ourselves in and, and um, you know, or, or some people, you know, have experienced um, addiction or, or issues that they have worked through and have been able to recover and come back stronger. And those people um, deserve an opportunity just like everyone else, right? So mm -hmm. we're really looking into ways of how we can um, not, we people out by making decisions uh, around, um, you know, very minor convictions that um, don't necessarily tell the whole story about who that person is. That's great. And on, in a similar vein, I know many companies that I've worked with are also don't always require an undergraduate degree for many reasons, oftentimes for financial reasons, personal reasons. I know several very qualified now executives who, you know, couldn't finish college. They were, you know, either financially or enabled, they were taking care of a sick relative. And that shouldn't, again, for similar reasons, shouldn't be a a reason why they don't get the opportunity um, to interview for a job. And I think um, in that part, I know for me, I, whether it's your resume, job applications, be truthful, right? If you don't have a degree, share that you don't have a degree because it's also even worse if you um, say that you do. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think more companies are thinking differently in the past about all of the other, it's, um, what uh, Karis was sharing about, you know, prior more minor convictions or even education are really thinking more broadly about this. So I, I love that you brought up education because that, that's a that's huge as well. I think, um, you know, we're kind of even seeing the trend of people saying, hey, maybe I just can do the community college and then take more focused specific courses on what I want to do right and i think it's mm -hmm. uh, this is really relevant in the creative space right mm -hmm. so if i'm a, a designer or artist or whatever it is doesn't mean i don't use math but i don't necessarily <laughs> have a full-on you right. know uh mba to to do this role and i think it's um that's a that's a huge point that also like you mentioned in some underserved communities it may be a barrier to uh, reaching your career goals. And if it's not really necessary, we look at that, right? Do we need mm -hmm. to have a uh, someone with a bachelor's degree in this role? Do we need to have four years of college? Um, maybe their experience is a substitute for that. So yes, I, I agree with you though as well. You definitely wanna be honest um, and, you, and, and not just about education. Even the companies that you work for, I've uh, had instances where people uh, leave stuff off their resume and then come to find out they work for such and such and they didn't mention it because maybe they got fired or something like that. Um, you know, those situations are also just like uh, the weakness, an opportunity to be really authentic, talk about maybe the mistake that you made or, or led to your dismissal and how you learn from that and were able to level up. So look at those as opportunities to talk to, to, to show, um, you know, where you've come from and, and how much you've learned and, and gained from those experiences. Mm -hmm. And something that actually, I, that, I, that, that was my last question. One more question um, I was gonna ask you and then Lizzie, we can open it back up to our community is references. Um, you know, oftentimes, you, sometimes you put references on your job application, sometimes you're asked for references at the end. I think s similar theme of, I always tell people, pick references who can speak to you in an authentic way, right? This yeah. isn't your best friend who's just gonna say, 
Karis is amazing. Karis is amazing. <laughs> I know when I, which, you know, you are, but you want someone who's also going to validate who you were in the interview and share those authentic stories. I might say, you know what, um, Jess got laid off. It was because of this reason. She is still amazing, right? Because I know that if everyone just says, feels like these boilerplate, please, I'll, I might just go ahead and call someone else. Exactly. To get the real, <laughs> you know, to, to get a fuller picture of the person. So I'm just, do you have any other um, thoughts on, on references or points to add around that part of the process? No, I, I think you hit it on the hill on the on the on the nail there. You definitely want to have people that can give some some real color, some share some experiences about um, working with you, um, not just the whole bunch of you know cheerleaders because that's definitely going to set a little red flag for me. Yeah. I'm going to be like, okay, who do I know that works at blankety blank? Let me give them a call and see if they were there with him during this time. So yeah, hundred percent. Yes. And I'll, you know that we do that. Like recruit, we do that. We call, <laughs> we would never jeopardize, right. We would never jeopardize anyone's, you know, job. We try to find people from prior, you know, maybe who worked with you in the past who we happen to know, because we want to get a whole picture of, of who you are. Um, Eat the real there. You, you did great on my interview. <laughs> um, thank you for answering all my questions that I mentioned. I know we've been getting lots of questions um, from our community. So Lizzie, if you want to, the voice from above, if you want to chime yes. in with some other questions that we've gotten, please let us know. Yes, we actually have quite a few. So hopefully we can do a little bit of a, a rapid round. Um, okay. I will go ahead and start with, um, oh, actually there's two that are kind of related. Um, we had a question on thank yous. Is email, LinkedIn, or handwritten note best? I'm going to say email for me. Um, you know, LinkedIn can be tough to sort through sometimes, especially, you know, again, if it's a, you know, a, a in vogue company, a, a popular company, I get so many messages that it's very easy for me to miss on LinkedIn. So I think email is the best way. Handwritten is lovely, um, you know, and, and probably would stand out. I'm not against, I'm not against handwritten at all, but sometimes there might, you know, with mail and everything, it can be a little bit of a delay. Um, but yeah, I'm not mad at handwritten. What about you, Jess? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I think just hard, harder in our, um, in the remote world to know where actually someone physically is, right? Um, they might be at, if they're at an office and you know they're going to receive, because uh, yeah. uh, you want someone to receive it, right? right? Especially if you're taking the time to write a handwritten note and they might not be in their office. They could be working in another state. So I say, yes, a handwritten note, if you know where they are and they're going to receive it, that makes you stand out. But I agree, email is great because then also you can have that back and forth, yeah. right? If I get the handwritten note, I, I'm probably not going to write a handwritten no. note back. <laughs> and then I have to look up your email. So I think um, you, you have to balance balance the two, standing out or knowing you're going to get a response over email. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, we have another interesting question from, I'm sorry if I slaughtered the name, uh, Ufono Bazi. Um, they asked, what are some red flags you look for when interviewing? Mm. Um, you know, I think we touched on a lot of them. I, I think red flags are just people who are unprepared, um, don't know anything about the business. Um, you know, uh, look for, for, for skims and good Americans specifically. I'm always trying to like weed out fans and, and things like that. Um, really, uh, red flags are people who lie, um, or omit the truth. Um, those are some of the big ones for me. Yeah, and I would say like high ego. I mean, I don't, and oh. just, you know, and the, and I, 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 yeah, I, 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 or sometimes you ask one question and someone just will talk for 10 minutes without pausing or stopping. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it should be a conversation. And while we are there to learn about you, when we want to know you're collaborative, because no matter where you work, you're going to have to, there's a we and a team. Yeah. So making sure you, you, you highlight your achievements while still acknowledging the group that you worked with and you, you pause and don't give a monologue. Sorry, it was two things in one. Yeah, those are good ones. 
Thank you. Um, and great question again. Um, another question that we've received is um, what, actually, let me start with this one. <laughs> with candidates with less experience for a role, how can they help stand out? That's a good one. Um, you know, I think, uh, in my opinion, it's it's attitude over skills every day, any day. Um, if you don't, let's say, check all the skill boxes, I think it's really important to show that you're eager, you're ready to learn. Maybe you give some examples of how you were able to, um, you know, you came into something, maybe you didn't have all the skills, but you're able to learn and research and, and get to the level that they needed to be. Um, you could talk about promotions that you received, um, but really attitude, attitude, bring a lot of energy. Um, you might want to talk about why you uh, want to come into this this company or this brand and and how you're willing to come in at an entry level so that you can work under the people to learn and get the experience that you need. So um, I, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't look at that as a, a no just because you don't have all the skills. I'm really looking to see um you know the the attitude and the eagerness because skills you can teach i i can put you in all types of people to get yeah. training i can't teach you how to have the right attitude or or you know to, to be eager to work here or eager to learn so i think those are the things that you put forward in cases like that yeah totally agree and to Kara's point earlier about that first email like or that first outreach if you recognize that maybe you don't have yeah the experience that the job descriptions ask for. One, acknowledge that you could even say like, I don't have the experience, but I'm passionate about your brand. You attach a project, like, and I agree, like enthusiasm, Yes. You, you know, there's no substitute for that. I would much rather hire someone who has the passion, enthusiasm for the brand than someone who might check every box, but doesn't have it. Cause you can't fake that, right? You can't teach, you can't teach fashion, right? You either have it Absolutely. or you don't. So go above and beyond, and oftentimes that, you know, that makes a difference. Amazing. Thank you both. Um, another question is one from Sojourner. Um, they asked, how and when should we address the salary in an interview? So for me, I, I do that in the first interview. I'm not going to get all the way to the third interview and then, you know, you say something astronomical and I'm like, oh, that was a huge waste of time because we can't we can't meet anywhere there. So generally in the in the screening or in the first interview, I'm going to ask, hey, what's your target or what is your range that you like to be in? I may not you know, if you have a specific number. Great. I'd love to hear that, too. But I kind of look at that as kind of some of the housekeeping parts of, of the interview that we need to do, um, what's your target salary, what's your target start date, um, what title are you interested in? These are, are maybe not questions that I would answer right then, you know, oh, this is the salary, this is the, but um, I at least need to know that we're in the same neighborhood. Same. <laughs> agree, agree with everything Kara said. Perfect. Um, another question we, we received is from Josepha, who asked, what are interviewers looking for in portfolios? Is a diverse portfolio better than a niche portfolio? Um, I think it depends on the role. Really, you know, uh, I think diverse is good because you want to, um, you know, as a brand, sometimes depending on what we're selling, for example, here at the moment, you know, we may have a certain look for a specific drop and a different type of theme for another drop. So I do want to know that you are flexible and can do different things and, and there's different sides of your creativity. Um, you know, um, I think that really what we're looking for in a portfolio is the skill level, number one, and then also to say, hey, do they do our type of media or whatever that might look like in the moment? We're trying to see, hey, OK, this looks something like our brand or this is um, something we can build on. And and sometimes, let's say if you've worked for um, companies that are totally a different industry, that may be a little bit difficult to 
come through, which is why I love a test project, which is also why um, I recommended earlier to do something specific for that brand that can show that you can also um, do what they do or speak their language or, or, or be on, on brand with, with whatever your, your creative specialty is. Thank you, Karis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just breeze through two more questions with you all. Um, one is from Jamie Evans and they asked, what is the best way to approach the cover letter? Is there a length that is too long or too short? Um, you know, I think two or three paragraphs max on a cover letter, you know, it, it you want to just highlight a couple things about yourself that you think may resonate with the, the reader. Um, but it doesn't need to be, you know, a long book. I'm probably not going to read that much. Generally, on a on a cover letter, um, I'm scanning. You know, I, just to be really honest with you, I'm, I might be going through a hundred applicants, or so I'm scanning. I'm I'm looking for keywords, key um, key sentences that stand out to me. So I wouldn't make it too long. Just to maybe give a couple highlights about your experience why you're into the brand, why, why, why you want to be um, considered for the role. That's about it. Yeah. I was like, say, whether it's an email or a cover letter, it's your, sometimes someone's just looking at your resume and it's your elevator pitch, right? It's yeah. you're not, it's your ability to connect the dots and say, for instance, what we were talking about, like, you might look at my resume and don't, this is, it's, you know, it's almost six o'clock. I'm not going to word this perfectly, but <laughs> You know, I'm passionate about your brand. It might not put through on my resume, but I've been interning in this space for eight years. Like it is your time to make yourself stand out. And it's, you know, it's not in person. So write it, you know, in a way that if someone is skimming it, they're going to feel that. Um, but to me, it's, it's all about selling yourself in a concise way. The other people say, like, imagine you're on the other side of that, right? You don't want to read four paragraphs. We're, we're often looking at things on this device, right? right? <laughs> so it's, it's got to be something concise and to the point. Thanks, Jess. Um, our last question um, for the evening is, what is your best advice for creatives just starting out? Network, 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 network. Um, you know, uh, reach out to people on, on, you know, make a list of companies that you're interested in, go on LinkedIn, reach out to, you know, four or five people who work there. Um, hey, you know, on a Friday, can I bend your ear? Um, you know, just try and build relationships is really what you want to do. Um, you know, even if I don't have roles open, I often, you know, people will ask, hey, do you have a few minutes to talk about your career or um, roles that you might have in the future? If I do, sure, maybe I'll say, hey, you know, I don't have anything right now, but pop something on my calendar for, you know, two weeks down the road or, or a month later. Um, you know, looking for a job is a job. I mean, you have to make invest some time in into it especially if you um, want to find the the right space for you so um it's just all about building relationships and and meeting people um because maybe i don't have something right now but six months from now a year from now i might say hey oh i talked to that great whoever um you know designer um a few months back let me let me reach out to them um, and, and keep the relationship going. You know, if you, if we speak and it's six months from now, reach out and say, Hey, you know, just wanted to, to say, this is actually the holidays is a great opportunity to reach out and say, Hey, just wanted to, um, say happy holidays and happy new year. And, and, you know, see if you have anything open or, or available or, um, so definitely it's, just, it's all about networking, building relationships. If you're just starting out and, and getting your foot in the door. Yeah, I agree. And be bold, right? I think we, yeah. we hopefully we've all, we all, when we were starting out, we had people who helped us. And I think one, my point earlier, people love to talk about themselves. Um, <laughs> and also we want to give back, right? Like I always try to make time to talk to people. So 
reach out to the people you want to talk to. Hopefully they say yes. If they don't say yes, don't take it personally, yeah. right? Because we're all busy. Sometimes that email falls to the bottom of the inbox. But to Karis's point, talk to as many people as you can, not only to network, but also you're going to learn, right? You might learn yeah. about a company you thought you wanted to work for, but then you, you're like, oh, actually, I don't think this is right. And learning companies or roles that you don't want is equally as important to, uh, as learning about the companies that you do want to work for. So it's, it all comes down to like, reach. I think our, our themes here are, are um, you know, do your homework, talk to as many people as possible, be authentic, uh, your true self. Interviewing is a two-way street, so take advantage of that. Um, anything else, Karis, that keep going? Um, yeah, research, research. Um, be persistent, be resourceful. Um, keep trying, you know, they're, they're, uh, like Jess said, you know, sometimes you may not get a response, send another email. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. They can just either ignore you again, or maybe they answer, you know, but, but, um, yeah, I think, I think you hit the, the big ones there. Well, thank you both so much for yeah. the evening. I think that was it for questions. If you guys would like to share any last final thoughts. Um, I, I don't know. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can send me a message. Like I said, I might not get to it right away, but um, definitely um, we'll get back to you. My Instagram handle is like Paris with a K. If you want to DM me or message me um, there as well, that'd be great. And I'm Jess at creatively.life and you know, ha happy to answer any questions that maybe we didn't tackle today. And Thank you all for joining. We hope uh, you found this helpful. Thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gareth. Bye.